Good evening. Have I got my, my favorite place behind me? <laughs> so it's great to see you again. I'm sure you've had a great day. And this is now a workshop on meditation, which, of course, uh, can be also called mindfulness. Um, so I'm going to give a little class. And I just want to remind you of one or two key points that I mentioned this morning in my talk, and some of you might not have been here for that, so just to remind you that one of the big um, misconceptions about meditation is about the thoughts that come up when we meditate, and what, what, what does that mean? You, you know, people try to meditate as if they're trying to switch their mind off and go into a blank state, clear your mind, blank out your mind, still your mind. I mean, all of that doesn't work because the more you try to still your mind, the busier it becomes. It's like if I say to you, don't think about a monkey, you'll think about a monkey. Um, and in fact, the more you try and push your thoughts down, the, the more they bubble up. And you've got to kind of question, why would we think that that is the exercise. What, what would be the point of just zoning out into a kind of trance? That wouldn't really have much benefit. So it's a different game altogether. It's not about suppression. It's not about silencing the mind. It's about learning to not get so involved in the thoughts and just let them go. Traditionally, they use imagery such as clouds in the sky. The thoughts can just go by like clouds in the sky. A modern image would be traffic. You're standing at the side of a road, lots of cars going by. Do you get in those cars or not? That's the question. Maybe those cars are taxis. Taxi only stops if you put your hand out, and then you get in the taxi and go for a drive. So in my example, these taxis represent our thoughts and our emotions and all the stuff that happens in our mind. And we tend to flag down the taxi and get in it, even though we don't want to. We go for a drive around town. We end up the other side of town not knowing how we got there. And there's a huge bill to pay. That's usually what happens with our thoughts and emotions. So it's, it's almost as if we're compelled into these thoughts and emotions, and we don't know how to distance ourselves. And even though we are intelligent, educated, free-thinking people, um, we're not really free deep down inside because our moods, our mind states, we don't choose them. We don't choose to be irritated. We don't choose to get annoyed. We certainly don't choose to be depressed or anxious. So there's not much freedom there. The mind is doing stuff we don't want it to do. So it's almost as if we are automatically, unwillingly, jumping in all those taxis in our head. So the meditation is about letting those taxis go by. I'm not, don't take this example too literally. I don't mean you have to sit there thinking about taxis. <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking just in terms of a metaphor, you know? So it's about letting it go by, so letting the thoughts go by, not getting so wound up in them, and remaining present. Now, obviously, in our daily life, we need thoughts and we need emotions. We need to think about the past. We need to plan the future. But can we do that with more choice, more clarity, more freedom? So in the session itself, we're learning just to let all those thoughts go and not get so wrapped up in them. What that means is that our power of awareness and choice is growing and building through our practice. And so as that grows and builds and we become better at it, we'll find that we are less tormented by our own mind. Now, sometimes we are tormented, but also another thing is we'll find that we get less distracted and we can be more relaxed, more calm, more happy. We can choose more how to feel. This is how we can grow through meditation training. But I really wanted to kind of break it apart for you to, so you can see that, what the technique actually does. Now, how do you do that? because it's very difficult just to sit there and not jump into those thoughts. So we give ourselves something else to focus on. We give our mind a focus. And that's something like the breathing. 
A very common meditation technique is to focus on your own breathing. Now, you might think that sounds incredibly simple. We will try that in a minute, and you'll see how difficult it is. Why is it difficult? It's difficult because we can focus on our breathing for about three breaths, and then suddenly we're off. You know, the mind starts writing lists, shopping lists. It, it does major internet shopping in our head. It writes emails, it plans dinner, it plans revenge, it does all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and th the breath is going on all the time. It's not like we stop breathing, but we've lost the connection. So that's the work. That, that, it's like going to the gym and lifting weights. You get back on the weightlifting machine, you lift the weights. So the work is you find yourself writing an email in your head or whatever, and you just come back. So you're watching the breathing. I mean, watching is the wrong word because that sounds visual. You're, you're more sort of, you know, you're aware of the breathing. You're feeling the breathing. Breathing normally. You're not breathing deeply. You're just breathing normally. And you are aware of it. You are focused on it. And then your mind starts doing its stuff. It, it, it drifts away. And then you catch yourself. You think, oh, I've drifted. You don't tell yourself off. This is where the compassion and kindness comes in. You don't feel like a failure. You don't, you don't feel like you've, you've sort of done it wrong. You just gently come back. You just return. You, you literally just bounce your attention back to your breath. And then you're there again with the breath. A few more breaths, and then we're off. <laughs> and then you come back. It's, a, it's an exercise of constant ongoing rebalancing, refocusing, coming back, returning. And it's incredibly boring. <laughs> <laughs> don't look for, for, don't expect to start having a halo or seeing lights or floating on clouds. It's, it's, it's exercise. But it's incredibly enriching because the more you do this, the more you can start to feel less bothered by your own mind. You, you can find that you can let go of suffering more easily, or you can put yourself in a positive mental state more easily, because you're developing that, that um, kind of inner power almost, power of choice. Instead of the mind automatically, unwillingly getting dragged into all those taxis, you're learning which taxi to get into. Because every time in the meditation session, every time your, your mind wanders and then you bring it back to the breath, every time you do that, you are strengthening your mindfulness. You're, you're learning that skill. It's like lifting weights and your muscles get bigger. So it's a training. It's like going to the gym. I keep using exercise as a analogy because it really is like that and just like with exercise you've got to do it regularly i mean there's no point deciding to get fit and then just sitting around reading the keep fit books you've got to do the exercise and also there's no point going to the gym some people do this they go to the gym and they keep running to the mirror to see if they've got muscles or they've lost weight <laughs> or somebody who's on a diet and they keep jumping on the scales every 10 minutes and then you know, feeling like a failure that they haven't lost weight. It doesn't work like that. You do the diet or you do the exercise, and then slowly over time you notice your body has changed. It's the same with the mind. This is fitness training for the mind. That's what it is. So that requires regularity in terms of doing it every day as much as possible, and it requires patience, just like going to the gym. If you can really hold those two key points in mind, regularity and patience, then, then you'll find it quite easy. It becomes frustrating if you're constantly looking at your watch thinking, when, when is this going to work? So I would recommend starting with a 10-minute exercise every day. 10 minutes is nothing. People always say, oh, I don't have time for meditation. Everyone has 10 minutes, even somebody with a really busy life. I've got a really busy life, and I meditate every day. It, it doesn't... There's no question about it for me. It's as important as eating or drinking. So, so it's quite easy to do 10 minutes a day. I do more than 10 minutes, but if you're starting out, 10 minutes, that is no sacrifice. And when you start doing it every day, you start noticing the benefits, and then you might do 15 minutes. You might do 20 minutes. You might only do 15 minutes for the rest of your life, and you will get a lot out of it. So what do you do during those 10 minutes? You would sit in a quiet place, 
It's got to be relatively quiet. You'll never find a place that's totally quiet. I did a four-year retreat on the Isle of Arran, and there were no phones, no internet, no interaction with the outside world. But there were sheep bleating in the field outside my window and birds, and I, I, I thought, I can't get quiet. So wherever you go, there's always a bit of noise. But you can find a relatively quiet place, and you would sit... Uh, you can sit in a chair. I mean, the real traditional meditation thing is to sit cross-legged on the floor. Uh, not many people do that, really. A lot of people tend to learn sitting on a chair. And you just need to be in a quiet place, quiet-ish place. Morning is probably the best time. Were you here earlier when I talked about cortisol, how we have these spikes of cortisol? Well, when we wake up in the morning, we have a massive cortisol spike. When, when the body wakes up, it produces a big spike, of, spike in cortisol to deal with the change of state. So you want to bring that down. So if you meditate first, in the, first thing in the morning, you're bringing your cortisol down. So it's a good time for training. It means you don't start your day stressfully. Most people start their day with stress. Think about it. If you wake up with an alarm clock, you're being shocked awake. Then we just jump into our day. So why not take those 10 minutes just to bring it all down, just relax, just be calm, be present, and let your day start from that launch pad. Some people find it very hard to meditate in the morning. That doesn't mean you're a failure, just do it in the evening. It really is, you know, very flexible. But if you want to know what's the best time, I think morning is best. What do you do in the session? You sit in a chair. You don't want to sit in a big, you know, armchair where you sink into the chair. You'll fall asleep. You want to sit in a chair where you're having to be quite upright. So you actually don't want to be leaning back. You want to be sitting upright. Now, you, if you do that, you often get lower back pain because you're having to kind of hold your body upright. So the way to remedy that is to get a small cushion and place that behind your lower back so that it's wedged between the base of your spine and the back of the chair. And that gives you that little sort of lower back support, and then the rest of your back can be nice and upright. Your feet are flat on the floor, you know, pl planted parallel on the floor. Your hands are palms down on your knees or the tops of your legs. So you're very, you know, balanced in your body. You're very symmetrical to the best of your ability. If you have some kind of physical um, um, issue that means you can't exactly sit like that, that doesn't mean you're disqualified. It's within your own capacity to be as disciplined as possible in your posture. So you're sitting in a good posture, and then the session, we're going to do it in a minute, but I just want to run you through the, the uh, sequence, first of all. The session involves three or four steps. Step one is to actually think about why you're doing it. It's no good just to launch into meditation. It becomes very random. You've got to have a few moments of positive thinking. Uh, maybe positive thinking is not the right word. It's a bit of a kind of weak term. But what I mean is you want to motivate yourself with a very positive intention. You want to kind of lay the ground of pure motivation to really put that in place as you start your session. The way to do that is to spend a few seconds just making a decision. I am going to meditate for my own benefit, but also as a gift to the world. It's not just for me, it's for everyone. Because as my stress reduces, as my clarity increases, my compassion will increase, my relationships will improve. I can produce some kind of peace in this world. So having that intention of compassion towards yourself and compassion towards others is a really good way to start the session. You've created the right motive for your practice. So that means spending a few seconds just creating that decision. I'm doing this for me, I'm doing this for others. It's literally just an idea you create in your head. That's the first step, just takes a few seconds. The second step, before you go to the breathing, is to be aware of your body. What that means is just focus on your body and feel how you are sitting and where you're sitting. The easiest way to do this is to feel the connection between your body and your chair. You, know, you can feel where your body is in contact with the seat, with the back of the chair, where your feet are in contact with the floor. Those points of contact are very easy to focus on. 
This body awareness just puts you into that present moment, gets you ready for the breathing. That's the second step. So first is motivation. Second is body awareness. We're going to do this together in a minute, but I want to just talk you through it first. The third step is the breathing. Well, it's not like you start breathing. We, we are breathing 24-7, but you start being aware of your breathing, which means you don't change your breathing. You don't have to start panting like a dog or anything like that. You just breathe normally, just lightly, just however you normally breathe, but you start focusing on it. You, you locate it, you feel it. Where do you feel it? Maybe you feel it in your, in your chest, maybe you feel it in your belly, maybe you feel it kind of rising and falling. Where do you feel it? Just kind of hunt it down, find it, and then focus on it. And then you can get more specific. Uh, you can start feeling where it comes in and out of your nose. If you can breathe through your nose, it's ideal. If you've got sinus problems, of course, breathe through your mouth. But if you have a choice, breathe through your nose and start focusing on the sensation of air flowing up and down the inside of your nostrils. Don't breathe heavily in order to feel something because that's too easy. It's like not lifting weights properly or giving yourself too much help. You want to breathe lightly so that you have to put more focus to feel it. Do you know what I mean? A lot of people want to do some kind of deep breathing because it's really easy to feel it then, but that's not training. It, you want to just breathe normally so that you have to put just that more attention to find it, to feel it. So you're feeling the air coming in and out of the end of your nose. You're literally feeling that sensation of air brushing against skin at the end of your nostrils. If your nose is blocked, of course, breathe through your mouth, and then you feel, instead, you focus on the air traveling across your lower lip. So either way, you've got one point of focus. That's where you try and hold your attention, and that's where you find it really difficult because within seconds, the mind starts wandering, but then you learn how to keep bouncing your attention back to that place. That's your focus. The mind drifts, you bring it back. The mind drifts maybe for five minutes before you even realize it's drifted. It's okay, you bring it back. You get better at it as time goes on. When you're ready to end your session, you go to the concluding stage. Now, how do, how do you know when you're going to end your session? Well, the best thing is to time it. It's no good just sitting down and meditating to see how it goes, because on some days you'll do one minute, on some days you'll do one hour. It becomes really random and very messy. You want to actually give that kind of sense of discipline to yourself by saying, I will do 10 minutes, no matter what. If the house is burning down, of course, I'll get up and run. But otherwise, I'll, I will do 10 minutes. I will turn my phone off. I, I will not, five minutes into the session, think I wonder what's on TV. I'll do the 10 minutes. So that kind of discipline is really helpful, which means you time it so you have a clock next to you, not in front of you because you'll look at it all the time, just to one side. Some people set an alarm, but make sure it's a gentle alarm, not some shocking kind of drill. Uh, you can program your phone to give a nice kind of chime sound, like a, like a bell or something. Um, but anyway, the main thing is you, you time your session, and when your 10 minutes are up, you go to the concluding practice, which is to take the focus more generally into your body again, like you did at the beginning. Feel the ground under your feet, be aware of your shoulders, be aware of your body, all of that. And the last step is to again remind yourself of your motivation or intention, which is the compassion. To remind yourself, I've done this or I'm doing this for my own benefit, but also for the benefit of others. Through that kind of compassionate intention, you have a much deeper journey you're on. Otherwise, meditation is just about feeling a bit more relaxed. There's other ways to do that. You know, meditation's deeper than just relaxation. It's about actually finding out who you are and living your full potential for yourself and others. So you want to have that moment at the end of thinking why, you do, why you're doing this. So to recap, you've got step one, motivation. Step two, body awareness. Step three is the main practice, breathing. <coughs> Start generally and then go into the nose or the mouth, wherever you feel the breath. Then step four is the same as step two, which is body awareness. And the last step is uh, to, um, again, remind yourself of your motivation. So motivation, body awareness, breathing. 
body awareness, motivation. Five steps. Does that make sense? Any questions about it before we start? We're going to do five minutes together in a minute. Does it make sense? Okay, let's try it. So what I'd like to ask you to do is kind of come away from the back of your chair, because if, if you're leaning back, you'll get very tired. You'll either fall asleep, or your mind will go into kind of brain fog. You want to have that kind of clarity and awareness, which is all about sitting up straight. So sit up in a really nice posture. Feet flat on the ground, parallel. Shoulders nice and open. Hands, palms down on your knees or the tops of your legs. It's better to have your eyes open. People struggle with this at first. They want to close their eyes, but it just makes you sleepy or it makes you drift away. Having your eyes open makes you be super present. Being present means being here, not going somewhere else. So have your eyes open, but don't look around the room. That would be distracting. Have your eyes kind of half closed and looking downwards. So don't make your face fall forward. That's one mistake people make. They kind of start <laughs> sit like that. Your face is upright, but your gaze, your eyesight, is kind of angled downwards, looking into space. You're not looking at anything. You're not picking out spots on the carpet or um, hairs on the back of the neck of the person in front of you. You're not doing that. You're just looking downwards into space. And close your eyes whenever you need to, but essentially you're just leaving them alone. Does that work for you? Does it make sense? OK, so let's do the session. I'm going to guide you through those five steps. So get into that nice posture. Just find your kind of physical sense of balance and f uh, what's the word? Equilibrium. Good posture. Step one is to create that good motivation. Just have that thought or that chain of thoughts. I'm going to meditate for my own benefit and the benefit of others. It's for me, it's for everyone else. Just create that wish or intention or promise. Okay, step two, just relax into the body. Keep the posture nice and upright, but relax with your body. Start with your shoulders. Be aware of your shoulders. Let your shoulders drop a couple of millimeters as the tension dro drops away. Travel your attention down your body. Notice your tummy, your belly. Notice how usually it's held in or it's tight. Let it go. Let it relax. Bring the attention further down to where your bottom is in contact with the chair and the base of your spine is there. Just feel the chair behind you and underneath you. Focus on your legs. Travel the awareness down the legs into your feet. Feel the feet touching the floor. Feel the ground under your feet. You're really in the present moment just exploring those sensations. Okay, now we're going to move to the main technique, which is breathing. Just breathe normally, don't start doing anything to the breath, but start feeling it, feel the breath. Feel it in your body moving, feel your body moving, just focus in on the breathing process. A lot of people start holding their breath at this point, but don't, just let it be very natural, flowing in and out, no interference, no manipulation, just natural breathing. Feel it now in your nose. Focus on those sensations of air traveling across the skin as it travels in and out at the end of your nostrils. It's 
So you're feeling the air just coming in and out of the end of your nose. If your nose is blocked, feel the air against your lip as you breathe through the mouth. The mind wanders. You bring it back. It's that simple. Just keep returning. Don't get frustrated, just return. We'll do two minutes. Another minute. Okay, now to end the session, focus on your body again. Start with the shoulders. Bring the awareness down, the arms. Be aware of your body in contact with the chair. Feel the chair underneath you. Bring it down, the legs to the feet. Feel the floor under the feet. And the last step is to take a moment to remind yourself of the reason you're meditating. Just take that moment to feel the importance of kindness to yourself and kindness to others. That's why we're meditating. And stop there. <coughs> that was a five minute session, just to start with. I would recommend doing that every day for a week and then expanding to 10 minutes. Start small, it's much better to start small because then you build it up. So that was quite easy because you've got a structure there. You've got five steps. Step one, motivation. Step two, the body. Step three, the breath. That's what you spend most time on. When you're going to end, you do step four, which is the body. <laughs> step five, motivation. It's kind of a mirror. Steps one and two and four and five are like a mirror. So does that make sense? So that's really the technique. That, that, there are many others, but that's the main meditation practice which you will find in Buddhism, but also in the world of mindfulness, where it's you know, a secular, non-religious uh, approach. It's all the same. It's all about breathing. It's, it, that's the main technique. Everywhere you'll go, you'll find that one is the one everyone learns. And then there are other ones as well, using visual objects, using sound, using visualizations. I mean, there's a lot there, but this is the basic technique which it's good to start with and also carry on with for a long time. Um, and just to learn not to get upset with yourself when your mind wanders a lot. Because sometimes you'll have a session where your mind is just crazy. The whole time the mind is just whizzing round. It's okay. 
you occasionally manage to focus back on the breath, and that will get stronger and stronger as time goes on. Now, that's one thing. To, to meditate every day for 10 minutes is a really brilliant thing because you're learning how to develop that different relationship with your thoughts and emotions. But the other thing that's crucial is to then bring that practice into your daily life. Uh, a lot of people forget this, and they kind of do meditation in the morning, and then they go to work, and they're totally unconnected to it throughout the day. But you want to have those moments of connection throughout the day. Like I mentioned this morning, where you're just standing in a queue, or sitting in your car, or traveling, or behind your desk. Four seconds of just being aware of your shoulders, being aware of the ground under your feet, being aware of your body, relaxing your body, being present with your body. Using the body is the easiest way of doing this. Uh, th these tiny moments are crucial. Maybe you're washing your hands. You're standing at a sink washing your hands. Maybe you're brushing your teeth. Normally, we do these things distractedly. The mind is somewhere else. All you need to do is focus on the sensation of the toothbrush moving and brushing against your teeth, or your hands moving and the water and the soap and all of that. You're not thinking about it, you're just being. You're there with that being experience rather than going into a whole mental commentary. You will go into a mental commentary, but then you step out of that, step into the being again. The mind gets lost in commentary, step back into the being. If you can do this many times a day, it, it becomes your friend. You're, you're always connecting with that mindful, micro moments of mindfulness throughout the day. Doesn't matter how busy you are, you can do this anywhere. You can be in an open plan office with loads of noise. You just feel the ground under your feet, feel the chair under you. These moments of mindfulness throughout the day, when you're walking, when you're eating, when you're traveling, this is how it starts to work, because you're training every day and you're on your own, doing those 10 minutes alone, and then you're also bringing it into daily life. That's how it starts to really um, make sense. We've got a couple more minutes, if any of you have any questions. Is that the practice you do every day that you're doing daily? No, I do with different practices. But uh, the one I just taught you is the one many people, most people learn, uh, especially to start with. Yeah. Anything else? Um, it's less effective. It's not, a, it's not wrong, it's just less effective. Because if you close your eyes, it's going to be much harder to integrate your practice with daily life because you start to associate the meditative state with darkness. Your eyes are closed, it's dark. So it's much harder to, to, to work out that you can actually be in meditation while you're in the busy situation. So it just takes it a bit deeper if you have your eyes open. Anything else? Yes? Well, that happens when you're quite new to meditation. There are two, two things. If you're new to meditation, or if you're doing it not every day but occasionally, you get drowsy. The reason for that is because when you sit still and do nothing, the body's not used to that. The body's used to being busy all the time. So you're sitting still doing nothing, the body associates that with sleep, so it goes into a kind of shutdown mode. It's like when you leave a laptop alone, it goes into sleep mode. So the body doesn't know this new behavior. It just knows busy or sleeping. That's, those are the two states our body knows. You're teaching your body a new state, which is you're still, but you're aware. It takes a while for the body to learn that. So most people go through a drowsy period uh, when they learn meditation, and then they start waking up. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, so you, you're not gauging the impact by how many thoughts you have or whether you're, you know, it's not about that. You're gauging the impact around how it just helps you as an individual deal with your stress differently. You start to find you're just more relaxed. I work with a lot of teams in their offices, and after, go, after teaching them, I go back after three months or two months, and they say, they say things like, you know, we just react less, we, we get along with each other less, or we're less wound up by stuff. Uh, the results creep up on you in a way you didn't expect, maybe. We just find that you're more relaxed, you're, you're more happy. Um, I mean, I feel in myself, I'm more chilled than I used to be. I used to be a very anxious person, I used to be very 
tense and kind of jumpy, and now I'm just more chilled out. So I can feel it in my body and in my mind. It, it just creeps up on you like that. Well, that's ideal. Ideal is if you're having, a, you know, you're having a crazy time and things are going wrong and you can kind of put yourself in a mindful state. That's quite hard because we're in such a high-stakes situation, the mind just kind of freaks out. But if you train every day, then it means when you're in those stressful moments, you're more prepared for them. So you're less likely to get so wound up, or you will get wound up, but you can come back to your state of balance more quickly. So I always say, don't keep this up, up your sleeve for emergencies. Practice it every day so that you're ready for the emergencies. Anything else? Do you ever lose it? Lose what? <laughs> what do you mean, lose it? Do I ever flip out? Absolutely. But it doesn't last as long as it used to. <laughs> I don't get a chainsaw out, but I certainly... <laughs> I get upset, I get stressed, I get annoyed. Uh, that's, that's normal. But I find that it doesn't last as long as it used to, and I find I, I'm generally a happier person than I used to be, and kind of easier to get along with. Anything else? Can you drive? No. <laughs> but I do teach a lot of people how to use this in terms of driving. We all know the big thing with driving is when we're in a traffic jam, or when somebody does something on the road that we don't like, or when we're stuck at the red light, we go into cortisol. The body starts stressing. Use those moments to de-stress. When you're stuck in traffic or sitting at the red light, do some mindfulness. Don't, don't close your eyes because you, <laughs> <laughs> you are actually aware of the present moment, so when the lights change, you're ready to move. But it means you've actually reprogrammed your stress response. Because normally we get stressed out in traffic. It doesn't make the traffic move. It's a pointless reaction. But we can reprogram that. When did you become a monk? Uh, 24 years ago, uh, when I was 21. Anything else? Inspired what inspired me to become a monk? Uh, tremendous amounts of stress. <laughs> which, so I wouldn't really use the word inspire even. <laughs> I was really stressed. And I wanted some kind of deep, intensive treatment for my stress, and I bizarrely chose a Buddhist monastery. That seemed to work for me. Um, most of the people I teach don't go to monasteries or even become Buddhist. They learn meditation and they use it in their daily life. For me, it just felt like I wanted to immerse myself in that atmosphere, and that's what I did. We have a monastery in the borders of, the borders of Scotland. Uh, it's called Samueling. It's near Lockerbie. And the reason I'm up here in the Highlands is because we're trying to establish something similar around the Loch Ness area, hence the photo. Yeah. So um, we, we are looking for a place, and we want to start a kind of peace center up here. Not, not a Buddhist temple. We're totally not interested in spreading the word of Buddhism. We've got more than enough Buddhists. Uh, what we are interested in is, uh, <laughs> is creating a place of peace where people can learn mindfulness, yoga, tai chi, kind of holistic therapies, that kind of thing. And so we are trying to build somewhere or find somewhere. And if, you can probably see on the top left-hand corner our websites. If you look up there, you can, you can find out what we're doing and get involved. We're looking for a, building a team of people to help run a center up here. And there are also leaflets in your, in your bags. You've got bags, yeah. so there are leaflets in there. Leaflet with a picture of me, it's got our website on it. Are you close to finding that? Yes, we have actually found a potential place. What we now need is the people, because we have a very small group up here. We need people to help us make this happen, so do get involved if you'd like to. And even before we have the place, we have regular classes every week. Uh, look on our website and you'll see there's every week, just down the road from here, We've got uh, mindfulness and meditation classes if you want to come along. Do you find that your mindfulness or state of mind causes less acts on others? So, for instance, if you are at a class day, you are chilled out. <laughs> you would, yeah.
I, if you practice meditation, you, you, you can uh, positively affect others. You kind of chill them out, but it's not really, <laughs> you, you know, you can't just hang around that person all the time. You have to do it for yourself, so. <laughs> <laughs> But no, it's absolutely true that all of you, if you practice these methods, after a few days or weeks, you'll start noticing the benefit, and, you'll, and your friends and family will notice the benefit. I know people who are in relationships where one partner is meditating, and the other one doesn't, but the other one begs that person, please do more meditation, because you're nicer when you do it. <laughs> you're easier to be around. Um, you can definitely... Uh, you know, affect people positively because you're more present, you're more aware, you're not wound up, you're not less reactive. It can definitely have a huge effect on the world around you. We always try and live by the principles of the Dalai Lama. His most famous quotation is, inner peace leads to world peace. What does that mean? It means if we individuals pacify our mind, that's going to spread in the world. Another beautiful thing the Dalai Lama said was, if every eight-year-old child learns meditation, then in eight years, there'll be no more wars in the world. Because what happens in eight years? Those eight-year-old children are the ones who would potentially have been creating the wars, but they won't if they're meditating. So meditation is definitely not a personal, introspective thing. It's a socially engaged project to benefit the community. Any other questions? I think that if you're a meditator, you see other people doing stuff that's unskillful, and you, you learn to be more compassionate and maybe understand that they're stressed, they're lost in confusion, they're lost in a kind of mindless state, and that's why they do that stuff. So maybe you become a little bit less judgmental. And I'd say 90% of our suffering is because we judge others. Really, we, we suffer because we don't like what other people say or do. But that's a crazy way to live. It means we're a victim of everyone else. If you can change that through forgiveness, compassion, tolerance, you free yourself. I see the T sign. <laughs> Time to stop. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we don't use the breath. They tend to hold their breath. <laughs> So we are, we are doing a lot of teaching in schools, and that, that's spreading. It, I think it'll end up on the national curriculum. I really do. So thank you really so much for listening. And, um I'd, like to, um, I'd like to thank Susie for creating this incredible event and uh, making it possible for us all to come together and share these ideas. So thank you, Susie. <laughs>